All right, well, welcome. Um, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we have a fascinating evening for you. It's been way too long since we've been together for the Council for Life Trout Lecture. It was October 2019, was our last time together because as, as we all know, there have been some major disruptions in our lives. First, the tornado, which some of us were impacted by. Then the corona catastrophe. And even though the world seems to be spinning out of control and the magnitude of evil that is being exposed is overwhelming, we as Christians continue to march forward, doing what God is calling us to do, fighting the good fight for life, for family, for our faith, and for our freedom. In this fight for the sanctity of life, we know that the precious unborn children are human beings who deserve protection, and it's time to humanize our laws. We are honored to have an esteemed panel of experts with us tonight to discuss one of the most, or maybe the most, significant U.S. Supreme Court cases of our day, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. The Dobbs case is center stage and could very well overturn Roe versus Wade, which created a constitutional right to abortion before the unborn baby is viable outside the womb. Our panel includes Dr. Albert Moeller, Jr., who is president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Jean Scher, founding partner of the DC-based law firm Scher Jaffe LLP, who filed an amicus brief for the Dobbs case on behalf, behalf of the Charlotte Lozier Institute, and Danielle White, general counsel of Heartbeat International, who filed an amicus brief for the Dobbs case on behalf of Heartbeat International. The arguments have been heard, and the ruling is expected this summer. While a range of outcomes is possible, it is our prayer that every Christian spend time praying for God's grace, mercy, and favor, and that Roe versus Wade is upended. There's a, yeah. There's a local and national prayer movement called On Our Knees that some of you may know about that meets in person and online every Monday until the ruling. So please look it up and join the movement. Before you hear from our panel, I would like to introduce you to the Council for Life Director of Communications and Philanthropy, Suzanne Everbach. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. We are so grateful to you and Kenny for graciously hosting us this evening. Since 2001, Council for Life has prayerfully and joyfully executed our mission to empower women, men, and youth to make life-affirming choices. The Lord has blessed us abundantly over the past 20 years with faithful donors that has allowed us to fund over $10 million to more than 55 life-affirming nonprofits in our community. Our beneficiaries provide compassionate care to the most vulnerable, unborn babies, mothers, fathers, and families, and they meet them where they are in their time of need, providing them with Christ-like love and light and connecting them with the vital resources that they so desperately need. This evening, each of you in your chair has a form and a pen to join us as a 2022 Advocate for Life. Please be counted among those who want to protect the worth and dignity of every precious human life. 
each life made in the image of our creator, the author of life. We are humbled and thrilled tonight to share an exciting announcement. Council for Life has just been awarded a $75,000 matching grant from a very generous anonymous donor. It is of the utmost importance to this donor that any recognition for this grant be directed toward our Heavenly Father, who is the sustainer, provider, and creator of all things good. <laughs> this generous donor's faith in Council for Life as trusted stewards is such an encouragement as we begin 2022 with a renewed hope, as Lisa mentioned, awaiting the Supreme Court's decision in the Dobbs case, and thankful that the Texas Heartbeat Act remains in effect with over 12,000 babies' lives being saved so far. The matching grant is eligible for donations by new donors to CFL or donors who have not given to CFL for the past three years. Also eligible will be the amount by which any 2021 donor increases their giving. Each eligible donation will be matched up to $5,000 commencing this evening and lasting until the end of May of this year. We are grateful to be able to offer this match to double the impact of your giving. So we ask you to prayerfully consider becoming an advocate for life. We have a table in the back where after the program, you can drop off your form, you can ask any of the friendly CFL staff and volunteers if you have any questions needing clarification. We would be honored for you to join us as we seek to transform hearts and minds to create a culture of life and to end abortion. And now, it is my immense honor to introduce the distinguished Dr. Albert Moeller, who is going to open us in prayer. Thank you. Now, Father, we come before you with a sense of the moment, a sense of joy and a sense of urgency in gathering together because we share a concern to defend life as your gift, your gift to every single human being equally made in your image. Father, we worship and acknowledge you as the Lord, the giver of life. Father, we come with a sense of urgency just given the circumstances of our nation at this moment and with a sense of hope, not that in coming days the war will be won, but that the battlefield may be changed in such a way that we have new opportunities to contend for the sanctity and dignity of unborn life. And Father, we pray that what we might witness just in coming months in this nation would be a giant step towards the recovery of moral sanity and towards the defense of human life. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray that everything said and done here will be to your glory. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, let me speak on behalf of those of us participating tonight. It is a great honor to be here. Uh, we thank the Trouts for hosting this event, the Council for Life for uh, issuing this invitation. And I think it's safe to say all three of us felt a summons uh, to be here for the, uh, the urgency of this hour. Amen. It will be my opportunity to speak for a few moments about how we have arrived at this moment and, and, and what it means. Now, Christians know that uh, beginning with Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. From that point onward, there's something in terms of human history before everything. 
And uh, as we look at either Roe v. Wade in 1973, or we look at uh, the Dobbs case in the year 2022 and uh, the decision coming uh, in 2022, there's a timeline that's important. And uh, the difficulty is knowing, well, where do you begin this? Do we begin this with, uh, with Satan in the garden asking, hath God said? Well, yes, that's actually a very good place to begin. Do we begin with the contest for the dignity of human life that has existed throughout all of human history and, and continues? I, I want to begin tonight just by saying with a, a, a summary statement that the emergence of Roe v. Wade in 1973 may have come as a shock, but it should not have come as a surprise to anyone watching what had happened in this country. Number one, what had happened in the culture. One of the things we now know is that at some point in the 20th century, American culture, in terms of those who are the decision makers, adopted what we can only say is a, a worldview or an ideology of utter emancipation. The, the assumption was that human beings have been bound by boundaries, limitations, bonds, commitments, laws, moral judgments that must be overcome for human beings to be liberated and for human flourishing to take place. Second wave feminism came along and it, it had an open door in terms of previous claims. And by the way, many of those claims were leg legitimate. There, there, there have been genuine moments of urgency for emancipation. The problem is when that is generalized as an ideology and an ethic, where emancipation becomes supposedly the need of every single hour. That, of course, is, is key to the Marxist understanding of history. But we need to understand that in a way that was driven by all kinds of big movements, events, and shifts in the culture, the idea that human beings are being emancipated from all kinds of outmoded moral judgments was, was very much a part of, of the landscape. What would the law do in response to this? What would the courts do in response to this? It's very important for us to recognize Congress did not pass any law uh, establishing by congressional authority uh, a limitation on the states to, uh, to legislate or, or limit abortion. That didn't happen. This didn't come through the legislative process. It actually didn't come through the executive process in terms of its first uh, impetus. It, it came through the courts with the, the left in the United States understanding that their emancipatory agenda would not wait for Congress. It, it, it could not be established just by an executive, by the president. It would have to come by the authority of the courts. And uh, you can just do the math, 435 you know, uh, members of Congress and nine members of, uh, of the Supreme Court. And furthermore, going back in the 20th century, you had figures such as Woodrow Wilson in the early 20th century, even before he was elected president. He was a professor of political science at Princeton who said that we are a nation that has already outgrown its constitution. The constitution must catch up with the nation rather than the nation be bound by the constitution. It was a far more widespread belief than most of us would ever imagine. You get to the 1950s, but the 1960s are absolutely crucial because that's where both of these things come together. You have this emancipatory ethic with, this, with the, the psychological and political agenda of personal autonomy. Uh, the, the, the powers that be shaping our culture in the 1960s absolutely idolize the idea of personal autonomy, and they still do today. And so any limitation upon human sexual behavior, any moral sanction upon romantic attachments, uh, any kind of legislation or regulation against abortion becomes a, an unacceptable compromise of or restriction of personal autonomy. By the time you get to the arguments actually made by counsel for Roe v. Wade and Sarah Weddington, you know, right here in Dallas, uh, who, who made that, uh, that argument, uh, died just a matter of a, a few days. I think it was the 26th of December. And... Uh, I was in a bookstore here yesterday and found an autographed copy of her book about Roe. And you just think about this, what, what a responsibility to have owned and made that argument. And the argument was audacious. Basically that there must be a right to abortion if women are to be equal with men. In, in, the, in keeping with second wave feminism, it came along and said, in order for women to be emancipated from unrealistic uh, uh, restrictions, they must be equally able as a man is able not to be pregnant. You, you chuckle. That was a central argument. The constitutional arguments took very much a backseat in the entire equation because the constitution did, as will be explained. 
Basically, that also has to be explained by going back to the 60s with that emancipatory ethic and personal autonomy resulting in decisions such as Griswold on contraception, striking down a Connecticut statute that had legally restricted contraception. Now, again, I dare you to stay up late tonight finding in the text of the U.S. Constitution any reference to contraception. You will not find it. And by the way, technologically, it really took the development of the pill for this to become much of a legally significant issue. And by the way, I have to say as a theologian, you should recognize that not one religious body in historic Christianity had ever allowed for any acceptable use of birth control methodology until the Lambeth Conference of the Church of England in 1929. Christianity had been absolutely resolute on the gift of life. Christianity had been absolutely clear on these issues. But the Supreme Court, and it was William O. Douglas, uh, basically with no pretense of saying, I found this in the Constitution, and said, spoke of penumbras and emendations from the Constitution. Now, you have to be a philosophy major, familiar with Plato to come up, or Neoplatonism to come up with such thing. In other words, it was basically an acknowledgement, it's not in the Constitution, but that's not going to limit us. We can find it there. You can draw a direct line through other cases to Roe v. Wade heard by the court twice, by the way, uh, and then uh, handed down in January of 1973. I was a, a 12 or 13 year old boy. Uh, at that point, I was 13. And uh, at least a large part of who I am today is that I had Christian parents and, and a mother who was very active in the pro-life movement very early on. And so moms just understand, you make a huge difference. God bless you. An army of moms will change the world. And uh, I was confronted as a, as a very young child with the, the reality of Roe v. Wade when all of a sudden I recognized this was not expected by many Christians in the United States. M most Christians in the United States, and by the way, there's an answer for this. People say, well, the Catholics were there first. Well, of course they were. They were there. God bless them. They were on the front lines of the defense for life because given their experience in Europe, and given their understanding, better than our understanding of what was happening in, in the, the United States, and, and given their, their natural law arguments, uh, they, were, they were earlier in this. But the areas where legal abortion was available, by the way, in most states, were areas of much larger Catholic concentration than evangelical concentration. And so to be honest, I'm growing up in Florida, which was then a relatively small southern state, and uh, it was an issue that wasn't discussed in the culture because it wasn't legally accessible. And that was true where there are large areas of evangelical Christian concentration. The awakening came, and it came in the 1970s with the understanding of what is at stake. And it took first, by the way, many brave women who stood in the gap to make the argument and, and clearly to say, not only is this something that must not stand, but uh, Christians must be on the front lines of fighting for the defense of unborn human life with the understanding that if human life in the womb is not protected, it eventually will be protected nowhere. There was also a legal argument to be made. And uh, we will, in the course of this evening, hear, I hope, uh, something of how that legal argument came about in the beginning. First of all, it awakened many conservatives to the fact that we actually had a text, the Constitution of the United States, and it actually did matter in a way that most conservatives really did not have as a part of our intellectual furniture uh, going back uh, until the, the rise of judicial activism and, and such things as the Warren Court in the 1950s. But it was Roe v. Wade more than anything else that completely exploded this issue in the Christian conscience. And you would not have uh, the conservative movement in the United States today had Roe v. Wade not been handed down. Roe v. Wade was the catalyst. It was the fuse. It, it once lit, exploded in a massive sense of moral and political urgency and cultural concern on the part of Christians in the United States. We are here now because we have been frustrated so many times in the past. By the way, the, the court's majority, 7-2 majority, in Roe clearly felt that they had settled the issue. Some of them actually said so in their correspondence and in their papers, you can find this. They didn't settle the issue, thanks be to God. But they did awaken 
a lot of Americans to the fact that the composition of the Supreme Court really matters. And thus the power of the president to nominate members of the court really matters. And intellectually, the big awakening was the text of the Constitution really matters. Who can explain a jurisprudence consistent with the text of the Constitution? And thus we had the rise of a conservative response, which called the court and the nation to attentive to the text of the Constitution and of the law. We've been disappointed, such as in the year 1992, with the Casey case and the decision handed down by the court. It was the first great direct opportunity for Roe to be reversed. Instead, the court's majority basically upheld the central finding of Roe, establishing the possibility for some exceptions on the part of legislation in the states. But here's something just to remember, exceptions are exceptions. The rule is the rule. And Roe v. Wade continued as the rule. We've been through many abortion cases before the court since then. But what we now face is a case that presents facts and presents a constitutional argument that once the case was granted the writ of certiori, once it was known that the court had a sufficient number, four at least, to say that the court would hear this case, there was no reason for the court to take the Dobbs case unless it intended to deal with the fundamental questions. In the writ, the fundamental questions were actually identified. This court is going to decide whether Roe v. Wade is going to be reversed in a way that is even more historically momentous than was the case with the Casey decision in 1992. We're going to talk tonight about what we think the court will do. We're going to talk about what different actions by the court would imply in terms of how we should respond and defend the sanctity of human life in a post-Dobbs world. I want to state as a Christian, my first encouragement to you is to pray that indeed we will see the reversal of Roe v. Wade, knowing that that is not sufficient, but it is essential in order for us to press forward to the protection of every single unborn human life in the United States. We're gonna talk about what a reversal of, or a fall of Roe would mean there's a lot for us to talk about tonight, and I'm glad to be joined by two people who are in a superb position, given their expertise, to speak to this. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in turn, but first of all, I want to turn to Danielle White. Ask her to introduce herself, and then to speak about the brief in Dobbs and the central argument you're seeking to make, and convince us of it. Oh, all right. <laughs> you got a friendly crowd. Convince us. <laughs> That's good. I'm hoping the court is just as friendly as the faces I'm seeing out here. Hi, my name is Danielle White. I serve as general counsel for Heartbeat International. It's been just a privilege and an honor to work for Heartbeat International, which is the, the world's largest network of life-affirming pregnancy centers, uh, maternity homes, adoption agencies, medical centers. And um, I also uh, wrote the brief in, for Heartbeat in this case. Um, we also had the opportunity of drafting a brief in the NIFLA case, which involved a critical uh, First Amendment issue. I'm also a, a wife and mom of four kids. So um, to tell you a little bit about the brief, first, I actually want to step back a little bit, and I want to set the stage. It's 1992. It's the spring of 1992. Uh, the pro-life movement has been hard at work and believes that the composition of the court is finally favorable to maybe overturning the disastrous Roe v. Wade case. After Pennsylvania enacted a slew of abortion regulations, uh, Planned Parenthood challenged those regulations. And so in the spring of 1992, it was time for oral argument, much anticipated oral argument. Catherine Colbert, the attorney for Planned Parenthood, approaches the podium and she opens with what she believes is her strongest argument. That's the strategy for us attorneys, get our strongest argument out there first. And she says, quote, since this court's decision in Roe v. Wade, a generation of American women have come of age secure in the knowledge that the Constitution provides the highest level of protection for their childbearing decisions, end quote. She says, that Roe v. Wade has, quote, enabled millions of women 
to participate fully and equally in society. The court bought it. When the court issued its opinion in Casey, it embraced this idea that women need abortion in order to meaning, meaningfully participate in the life of this nation. Uh, the Casey court put it, participate equally in the social and economic life of the nation. And so um, the idea that women can either participate in this life, this social and economic life of our nation, or be mothers, but not both, it was that idea that was so antiquated and just so disempowering to women that when I was preparing for how, how do I write this brief, I, I turned to that oracle argument and I listened to it because I wanted to know what does the pro-abortion side believe is their strongest argument? That was it. It was this notion of reliance. It's called the reliance interest. It's one of the uh, factors for determining whether the Supreme Court will adhere to precedent. Um, it's this idea that um, women have reached their places in society not as a result of our determination, not as a result of our hard work, not as a result of our education, but because we've resorted to abortion, because we've taken that thing which is so unique, so special to womanhood, motherhood, and we've repudiated it. Can any of us imagine sharing that message with our daughters, that we have to repudiate our own motherhood, our own femininity, in order to meaningfully participate in the life of this nation? Sadly, so many in our society have been fought that lie. And so for 50 years now, Heartbeat International and our centers have been on the front lines telling women when they're facing unexpected pregnancies, you can do both. That's the empowering message that we share with women every day, day in and day out, for decades all across the globe. Indeed, women can be mothers and participate fully in society. And so we know that women do not need abortion. We've been sharing that message with the women themselves for decades, but now it was our time, fast forwarding to 2021, to share that message with the court. We knew that stare decisis would be a central issue in this case, and stare decisis means to stand by things decided. It's a doctrine of the court that it's typically and generally going to follow its own precedence when it makes a decision. But as the court has repeatedly stated, stare decisis is not an inexorable command. In other words, the court can depart from its previous precedence uh, when certain factors would weigh in favor of abandoning that precedent. And so one of those factors, as I mentioned earlier, is that reliance interest. Um, the court would take a look at the precedent itself and say, if we departed from this precedent, have too many people in the nation come to rely on it? Have we organized our lives around this idea, this, this precedent that we set forth such that we can't take it back, basically? And so that was what Heartbeat's brief really focused on, was that reliance interest. How did you make that argument? Give us a summary of how you made that argument. Yeah, so basically the argument is that so much has changed between the time of, certainly the time of Roe and even the time of Casey. I mean, even just, you think about the life of our nation in general. Right. Right now, I walk around every day with the internet in my pocket, right? Right. Back in 1992, the average person didn't have access to the internet, um, let alone the ability to complete advanced degrees online, let alone the ability to work from home, something that all of us have grown very familiar with during this COVID crisis. Um, but also, critically, there's now a network, a robust network of pregnancy help that did not exist in 1992 and certainly did not exist in um, 1973 when the court so, decided Roe. So that means that you were pointing to the fact that women today, in order to be full participants in society, are not actually relying on legal abortion as guaranteed by Roe v. Wade. That's correct, and to the extent that they think they are, 
they need not, they need not rely on abortion because there is this network of pregnancy help that exists to assist them through their pregnancies, to help empower them to finish their educations, to give them resources for careers. Um, you know, we have the opportunity of telling the story of three women who, in particular, though there are thousands of women who have been assisted by pregnancy centers, pregnancy centers that stepped in the gap that helped them pay rent, that helped them. I mean, can you imagine that? These women have, um, are facing an unexpected pregnancy and somebody says, I'm gonna pay your rent so that you can get through school. Um, they, they need not rely on abortion. They need not rely on ending the life of their unborn child. And so um, we had the opportunity to share just how much that network has grown, not only in size, but also in scope. You know, one, one statistic, if I could share, that's really interesting from the brief. Back in 1992, when Casey was decided, only three pregnancy centers in the nation were offering medical services to women. Now, that number is 2,123 centers that are offering medical services to women. Well, I want to ask you to hold that thought for a moment. And uh, we're going to turn to Jean Scher. And would you please introduce yourself and tell us about the, uh, the central argument of your brief? Well, thank you. Uh, let me first say what an honor it is to be here with all of you. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think you should be the ones who are being honored tonight for the terrific work that you've done uh, in the service of life. And it's an honor to be with this, uh, with this panel, Dr. Moeller, and his efforts to, to generate grassroots support for, uh, for protecting life, and, and Danielle for the wonderful uh, job that her and her organization have done to, uh, to, to help women choose to life. save their babies and carry them to term rather than, uh, rather than abort them. Um, my, uh, let me just introduce myself a little bit. My, uh, my wife and I, Martha, uh, we live in Deep Blue, Maryland, and uh, we are there. There are actually pro-life people in Maryland. Uh, my uh, my wife and I started, uh, you know, demonstrating our commitment to life by having seven children and uh, Amen. Uh, and and raising them in Maryland, and that kind of made us unicorns in our in in our community. And uh, six of our seven seven children have since decided to get married and have children of their own. Our youngest son is about to get married. Uh, later this year, but, uh, but we've been blessed with 12 grandchildren, including six of them during COVID. Um, it re re reminds me a little bit of the interview with the, with the South American baseball player. You remember where he said, uh, baseball been very, very good to me. COVID was very, very good to us in the, uh, in the uh, grandchildren department. Um, like, like Danielle, uh, my wife, Martha, is a, uh, is a genuine pro-life warrior. She's very, very involved in politics in Maryland, both at the state and the, uh, and the local level, and she has single-handedly prevented our state legislature over the last seven years or so when the bill has come up. She single-handedly prevented them from adopting physician-assisted suicide, which just keeps com coming up, and every, every year she has to find some new creative way to, uh, to stop it in its tracks, and so far, uh, so far she's succeeded. Um, early, early in my legal career, I had the, uh, the, the honor and the, and the privilege of being a law clerk to Justice Antonin Scalia uh, during the first year that he was a justice on the Supreme Court, and, and I think that's important for our discussion today because I believe he really laid the groundwork for reversing Roe versus Wade in, in two respects. Uh, number one, in the Casey decision, or the Casey case, and, and in other opinions that he's written over the course of his career, he vigorously criticized Roe from every possible angle, but especially from uh, he especially criticized it for having been completely unmoored from the text of the Constitution. And those of you who are lawyers or who, or who have studied the Supreme Court know that, that before Justice Scalia came to the court, there was really nobody there who was a serious textualist, as we call a judge who really takes the text of the Constitution seriously or the text of a statute seriously. Before Justice Scalia came on, came on the scene for, you know, for decades before he arrived, uh, the court the, and all the justices, almost all the justices on the, on the court basically viewed themselves as policy makers, you know, we, and they would kind of decide what they thought the best policy was, and they would write an opinion to justify that desired outcome, and they would call it law. 
and it really wasn't law. Uh, but Justice Scalia really created, I think, a, a revolution, not just on the Supreme Court, but in the entire legal profession and the entire judiciary in sort of wrenching everybody <laughs> towards the text uh, of both the Constitution and, and, and statutes. And uh, so much so that, you know, that a, a, a relatively progressive judge like Justice Kagan, uh, you know, ha routinely says, look, we are all textualists now. Um, you know, they, the different justices may not, may not be quite as committed to the text as Justice Scalia was, but all the justices on the Supreme Court now at least take the text seriously uh, whenever they're deciding a case under the Constitution or a, or a statute. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that movement towards textualism is really what makes it possible for the court to now think about right. overturning Roe versus Wade because all of them, when they, you know, when, they, when they look at what Roe decided and they compare that to the text of the Constitution, there's just nothing right. in the Constitution that, you know, that, that supports. We, we've got to shift to some specific questions. Uh, but I want to ask you, if yeah. you, what was the central argument you made in the brief for the Charlotte Lozier Institute? The, cent the central argument was that, uh, that science mm -hmm. on fetal pain and embryology and neonatal neonatology and all those s scientific subjects surrounding pregnancy and birth has advanced enormously. Uh, since Roe versus Wade, and, and the brief that we filed on behalf of the Charlotte Lozier Institute, which is a wonderful pro-life kind of think tank um, in Washington, and, they, and they, also, they also litigate cases, they don't lobby, uh, but, but the brief we filed uh, on their behalf was based on some, uh, some analysis that, that had been done by an expert witness that our law firm had recruited uh, for, for a case in Indiana. We, uh, we represent a number of states around the country in defending their abortion laws. Uh, and so we had found a, a, a terrific expert at the University of Utah who, uh, who had done, who, who really is the world's expert on fetal pain. And she had collected all of the relevant information, all the relevant data, and we had, we had helped her develop expert testimony for this case that was tried last summer. And then when Dobbs, when the Dobbs case was granted, we decided, well, why don't we put that into an amicus brief? And the basic point of it is, is that unlike the situation that existed in Roe, where most scientists really believed, and the evidence suggested that, uh, that human fetuses probably can't feel pain until about the age of viability, 24, 25 weeks, uh, Dr. Kondik's research showed and her analysis of the literature that has, been, that has become available since then shows that in fact a fetus is probably capable of feeling pain and suffering in the sense that we understand those terms uh, from probably 12 or 13 weeks. Um, and and she, she presented a number, a number of studies, for example, with, uh, with 4D ultrasound. Um, you can actually see a baby's reaction to, you know, to a needle. If a if a doctor is uh, is, you know, in, is doing a test of am amniotic fluid, or if a doctor is trying to do an operation on a fetus, you can actually see the baby's facial expressions, and uh, and the baby makes, you know, even at 12 or 13 weeks, makes the same kind of facial expressions that all of us make when we're when we're feeling pain. Uh, and, and not the kind of reaction you, you would expect if it were simply a reflexive uh, yes. reaction. There's a person. Uh, to, the, to the stimulus. There's a real person with a real face and, and from the facial expressions and every other bit of data, uh, we can infer, although we can't talk to them yet, we can, you know, we can infer pretty well that they are feeling genuine right. pain. Um, and so our argument And the was, appearance of genuine joy. That's right. That's right. And they can distinguish different kinds of sounds, and they and they react to different kinds of music. Those of you who are who have uh, who have had babies have probably seen that uh, for yourselves. But uh, 
but the basic point was that given how far science has moved on that issue since Roe versus, Ray, Roe versus Wade, uh, the court really needs to draw the balance of, of interest on this issue differently. Um, that, that research on fetal pain demonstrates that, you know, that, that children in the womb really can feel great pain, and the state has a powerful interest in protecting all life from unnecessary pain, right? We have laws protecting against animal cruelty, for heaven's sakes. We, we surely, the state surely has a legitimate interest in protecting fetuses from, uh, from unnecessary pain, a and that became one of the one of the main arguments in support of Mississippi's 15-week ban um, on abortion. So that's extremely helpful. And I think it's important for this audience to understand that the two briefs uh, produced by uh, these two very fine attorneys found their way into the arguments and into the oral arguments. And that's what makes tonight, I think, particularly exciting because what you heard tonight uh, was uh, the presentation of, of these amicus briefs from these two lawyers and the organizations and firms they represent, that actually you can trace into the oral argument. So let's go there for a moment, because the oral arguments uh, in the Dobbs case uh, were nothing less than fascinating. I want to refer you to the opening statement made by the Solicitor General of the State of Mississippi defending Mississippi's abortion law. And you talk about starting with your best argument. Well, here it is. He said, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey haunt our country. They have no basis in the Constitution. They have no home in our history or traditions. They've damaged the democratic process. They poisoned the law. They choked off compromise. For 50 years, they've kept this court at the center of a political battle that it can never resolve. And 50 years on, they stand alone. Nowhere else does this court recognize a right to end a human life, end quote. Mm -hmm. Now, friends. That was said before the Supreme Court of the United States. And one of the most amazing things that I would point to, as if you were listening to the oral arguments or you go read the transcript readily available online, you listen to them now. What you will note is that the other side made no answer mm -hmm. to that compelling argument. So I wanna to turn to the lawyers here. I wanna say, asking you in kind of a lightning round here, what was the most fascinating moment in the oral arguments for you? Well, I think all eyes were on Justice Kavanaugh for this oral argument, and so for me, the clear, oh man, <laughs> moment was when Justice Kavanaugh was questioning Julie Rink Rickleman mm -hmm. for, um, for the pro-abortion side, and he gave a slew of examples where the court has overturned its own precedent and said these were some of our most momentous, most important decisions and then he said, I'd like to give you a chance to respond to that. <laughs> and I'm glad I wasn't in her shoes because that's difficult to respond to. The fact of the matter is that the court, some of its most memorable opinions has overturned itself where it was egregiously wrong. So that was a clear highlight for me because it indicated where Justice Kavanaugh was. You know, I think that we knew pretty well going into the argument where certain justices were, but most people were watching very closely, yeah. Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Barrett, and to some extent also Justice Roberts. And they each had their own times where they tipped their hands a little bit, but that Justice Kavanaugh moment was a, was a clear um, source of hope for me. Yeah. I felt very hopeful after the argument. Well, we share that hope. Yeah. Jean? I would, have, I would have to identify three with it okay. when, I, when I put them together. Uh, I think tell us a lot about what's likely to happen or what, what may happen there. I, I think most, most people who watch the Supreme Court have known for a long time uh, that Chief Justice Roberts would be very reluctant to, to overrule Roe, right? He is known as, I mean, I, 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 I know him reasonably well and, and I know that he thinks Roe versus Wade was an abomination legally. Uh, and yet at the same time as Chief Justice, he feels an obligation to try to guard the guard the court's uh, public reputation, and he's concerned that by, you know, overruling Roe, Roe against Wade in one fell swoop would create a, 
you know, a huge public out, outcry that, in, in his view, would undermine the court's public repu reputation. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, but, but that is his view, and, it, and people who know him well and have watched him understood that that's what he would want to do, is he would, he would want to uphold Mississippi's statute, the 15-week ban, mm -hmm. but he would want to do it in a way that didn't actually overturn Roe. And so uh, right out of the box in his questioning, he sort of asked about this middle ground position uh, that, that would allow the court to do that. He said, well, is, isn't it enough, even under Roe um, and Casey, isn't it enough for us to say, look, all that those decisions really require at bottom is that a woman have a fair chance after she learns she's been pregnant uh, to, to get an abortion. And 15 weeks would give, would, would give women a fair opportunity to make that decision. Right, so, so we could uphold the Mississippi law on that relatively narrow ground, leave for another day whether we're gonna overturn Roe, right? That was, and, and you could see that in two or three of his questions, that, that that was kind of what he thought the court should do. Um, so what, what was most important to me about the argument is, is what Kavanaugh and Barrett did not say and that is, they did not express any interest at all in that kind of middle ground position. You know, their, right. their questions were more directed to, well, you know, should, should we just overrule Roe or not? As opposed to, can we find some kind of middle ground and have a bit of a kumbaya moment and save this more difficult decision for later? So that, you know, I, I concluded from that, well, there's a, you know, there's probably a better, even better than even chance that they actually will overrule Roe versus Wade. We're going to talk about what we think is going to happen yeah. in just a moment. Okay. And uh, but speaking of the oral arguments, I, I want to take the I want to look at the other side's statements uh, because as I was just hardly breathing, it seemed at times listening to those oral arguments. I wanted to hear how in the world are the those who are defending Roe going to make their argument. And that included not only the two lawyers who shared uh, the responsibility uh, to make the pro-abortion case uh, against Mississippi, but it included justices on the court, and particularly Justice Sotomayor, who just came right out and made the worst arguments imaginable. And by the way, she lost control of her own language. At times, you, you have the, the unborn child referred to as a baby, which uh, is something the pro-abortion movement doesn't ever want to do, but it, it came out. Justice Sotomayor, who's obviously a brilliant legal scholar, nonetheless spoke of uh, doctors and a, quote, huge minority who believe that fetuses can perceive pain. Now, just the word compound, huge minority, is a problem. That is not what she meant. <laughs> um, but in but, and, and her denial and her grouping together of someone who's in a deep coma, along with the unborn, as persons who, uh, who evidently are, are not really uh, to be considered human persons. And then her suggestion that human personhood is just a religious concept. In other words, no one can know this without any intellectual acknowledgement that Roe has a, is, makes a decision about human personhood and makes the decision that the unborn child is not a person. There's no, there is no position on abortion that is neutral on the issue of personhood. But I simply, in, in this part, want to, want to say that another illuminating moment came with Rinkelman making her case supposedly against the, uh, the Mississippi law and, and thus in defense of Roe, which she knew she was making. She, she clearly referenced that. She said this, eliminating or reducing the right to abortion will propel women backwards. That's that reliance principle. That's right. That's not a constitutional argument. It's not a textual argument. That's a moral argument. I think it serves an immoral end, but it's an argument based upon a sense of moral principle she's invoking, that it will propel women backwards. Uh, I just think that was one of those moments when you recognize they have a gun with no bullets. Mm -hmm. But they've been winning this long. We're gonna to turn to questions in just a moment. So uh, I know many of you probably have questions and uh, we're gonna to seek to address some of those questions, but I get to ask some now. And uh, one of the questions I want to ask, and all three of us will answer this, is what we think will actually happen. At the end of June, in the year of our Lord, 2022, Gene, what are you expecting to hear from the Supreme Court of the United States? I think it's more likely than not, not certain, 
but more likely than not that they'll, that they'll overturn Roe. Now, the reason I say I'm not certain about that is because, you know, it, it will take five justices at least to overturn Roe. It's clear that there are three justices who are committed to overturning Roe. Right. Justice, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, and Justice Gorsuch have all made very clear that they think Roe ought to be overturned. Um, Kavanaugh and Barrett are not, you know, are not on the, on the record yet on that, and the chief clearly does not want to, so all he needs to do for his, you know, for a more, what he would view as a more moderate outcome is just to pick off either Kavanaugh or, um, or Barrett, and if he's able to pick off one or the other of those, then, then Roe will not get overruled, okay? And I, I, you know, I assess that at about 35 or 40 percent, but I, you know, but I'm optimistic that the court will in fact do it because, because I don't think, based on the argument, that either Kavanaugh or Barrett is really interested in, in going down that path. And if that happens, I think the Chief Justice is going to say, okay, well, if I don't have the votes for my preferred solution, um, I'm just going to go with the majority and it'll be 6-3 to, to, over, to overrule Roe against Wade. Okay. You help us even with that, that explanation uh, to know how to pray. Yes. Danielle. <laughs> yeah, so. What do you think will be announced? What will be the headlines the morning after? Well, I think it's actually really helpful to know what's already happened, right? So after argument, the justices, the case is submitted, the justices leave, they go back into conference. And then at that point, they hold an informal vote right. so that they can begin the drafting process. And so the justices already know what that initial vote was. Um, now, there's legend that justices have changed votes in the past. There's legend that that's what happened in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, that yep. Justice Kennedy changed his vote. So um, they'll begin the drafting process, and a lot can change between those initial votes. We know in Brown as they versus Board of Education it happened because it's in the notes that are now accessible to the public. Right. So that's another point of critical prayer. Pray for these clerks that are drafting the opinions as they go back and forth. The clerks are the attorneys that work for each of the, the justices. Pray for the justices themselves. Pray for courage. Um, you know, as I was on the plane heading to D.C., I told a good friend that we ought not get our hopes up that this case would overturn Roe. After the oral argument, I thought, oh my goodness, they're going to overturn Roe. And happen. that's what my money's on. Good. Well, I'm a Baptist, so I've got no money on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, have lots of, uh, I have lots of hope invested in it. <laughs> Uh, th three quick things. Number one, the sense of history. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, at least four justices are required uh, for the court to take a case. So we know there are four who decided now's the time to take this case. There's really no reason to take this case unless you intend fundamentally to address Roe. Mm -hmm. uh, the sense of historical moment is this. If you, if you look at uh, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas, and, and then you go down the list, th there are a couple of those judges um, I guess three in particular, uh, the, the three uh, Trump appointees, um, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Those three may be on the court 20 years from now, but uh, barring some biomedical revolution, uh, some of the others will not. This is their opportunity, this kind of case. The, the Supreme Court is not going to take Dobbs two in three years. That's just not the way the court works without some kind of remarkable uh, historical development. This is the historical opportunity. The second thing is, if indeed you were hesitating and the, uh, the actual facts of the case and the arguments presented might convince you, I would simply argue that the case for defending Roe was an extremely empty case. Those lawyers gave any kind of equivocating justices absolutely nothing to use. The third thing I just want to mention is that the kind of comments made by Justice Sotomayor were on their face helpful to the pro-life cause <laughs> simply because they were so ludicrous. They were so out of line. Uh, I spend a lot of time when I talk about this case looking at Justice Sotomayor's comments as well as a few others, but that in particular just to say, realize what defending Roe means. L look at the rationale behind it, look at the result of it. We are going to turn to questions from you. 
And uh, as we're looking at the time and understanding our stewardship of this opportunity, there are undoubtedly more questions because of the importance of this issue and the, uh, the wisdom of this audience. But we want to turn to say, now is the time for you to say, I really need you to answer this. Thank you, Dr. Moeller. Um, yes, we are going to do a Q&A in just a few minutes. I'm Leanne Morris, and I wanted to explain how we're going to do the Q&A. Suzanne Everbach has a microphone, and she is going to be available for you to come to her to give your questions so that the panel can hear you. Um, it is an amazing panel, won't you agree? Um, We all have a lot of blessings in our lives, and I think that this evening's discussion is going to jump way up to the top of our blessing list, isn't it? Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about me. This past year, in 2021, I was the president of the board for Council for Life. Starting in January, I became the executive director. We owe you a formal announcement. But we've been really busy, and we will get to the announcement, I promise. But um, we thank you for your patience with us. It's coming. We want to tell you about Suzanne and her role as Director of Communication and Philanthropy, and my new role, too. Um, to our panel, my goodness, we thank God for each of you for your um, you know, brilliant minds, your articulate words, and of course, your insightful thinking. Uh, thank you for being here. Way to go. This was thank amazing. <laughs> I think that we have to thank God, too, because again, he has done the impossible. He has given these uh, men and women the ability to make extremely complicated constitutional issues, state laws, medical issues about brain uh, development in the womb and pain and the ability to, of a fetus, a baby to feel pain, uh, sociological issues of our nation, so clear and understandable so that each of you can go back to your community, to your workplace and explain how and why the United States Supreme Court granted abortion rights and uh, approved abortion restrictions. And of course, as we are praying for Roe to be overturned. Um, so thank you for doing such an amazing job with that. Um, I just um, want to, of course, before we end this evening, thank our hosts, Lisa and Kenny Trout. Your amazing generosity, your graciousness, your hospitality. The Trout Lecture has been a standard here in Dallas for so many years where you bring intellectuals, authors, speakers to address the most pressing life issue of the day. So thank you. We also are just incredibly grateful that you have been huge supporters of Council for Life. Lisa Trout was one of our founders and if I think about it, in fact, Council for Life started right here in this house 20 years ago. <laughs> we truly want you to know how deep our gratitude is for you. And perhaps each of you wants to express your gratitude as well. And I know one thing that would really make the Trouts feel great about hearing your gratitude, and that is standing united with hearts and minds for love for God and love for the life that he creates, each and every one of them, in the womb. And so part of doing that is speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves. And of course, the practical side of supporting financially uh, Council for Life so that then we, in turn, can support the agencies that do the hard work, the agencies that counsel the woman who is scared and really desperate, talking to the boyfriend who is in an absolute panic, and of course, helping the young teen who is homeless and hungry. 
We support ministries that go on college campuses and talk to college students and tell them the truth because they have been deceived by the culture that wants them to just embrace this idea that you can have sex and not be pregnant and that if you are pregnant, you can just get rid of it. It's not a person anyway, is their argument. And we support those agencies that open their hearts, their arms, their doors to the women and the men who have experienced the shame and grief of abortion, who have walked down that hallway and had the surgical abortion or the at-home abortion. So we are asking you this evening, um, you know, before we do our Q&A, for you to get that little card. I have one here. Um, it's easy to do. You can join us as an advocate. You can stand together with us to help fund the, the agencies that will help the women and the babies and the families. And um, as we know, if Roe is overturned, there will be more babies to help. Um, you can do this by um, you know, using the card and the pen at your chair. You can use the QR code and your phone. We all know how to do that. You can also go to our website, Council for Life slash donate. I think that it's an interesting statistic that comes directly from Planned Parenthood that one quarter of the population has or will experience abortion. That's tens of millions. A quarter of our population is, of adult population is 50 million. Those are the people that we want to stand with, to help, to invite in for support and healing. And we want you to do that with us. Together, we can help them and we can end abortion. So. Go ahead and go to the table, get your phone, get your pen, but first, let's do our questions for our panel. So thank you. Suzanne is ready with the microphone. As you're getting I ready- my phone first, though. <laughs> Did I have the card? Here it is. Thank you, Jean. Excuse me. Thank you, Jean. Well Jean. done. <laughs> uh, just a, a couple of things as you're getting ready to ask questions. If you were watching uh, the news the last 24 hours or so, you may have heard the former chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, now currently president of the United States, make the statement, and remember that meant he presided in the Senate over the Bork hearings, he presided over the Thomas hearings, they were debacles. Nonetheless, he said in a press event yesterday, he said about the importance of his nomination of a new justice, he said, well, you know the court gives rights and takes them away, so this is important. <laughs> well, just flush our constitutional order. You have the President of the United States who thinks that the Supreme Court gives rights and takes them away. Uh, that tells you what kind of challenge we have and the fact that if Roe is reversed, it will not mean that every single unborn life is defended. It will mean that the question returns to the states. Our job will be bigger. Mm -hmm. We will have 50 fronts, not, not just a national front. You already know that here in Texas, God bless you. And so there's gonna be a lot of work to be done, but it also points out that every single election, especially at the national level, is an election about whether or not unborn life will be protected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, and, and I think just to piggyback off of that uh, statement is really where my, my question lies. It's, uh, I want to start just by quoting William Wilberforce, uh, mm -hmm. who said of the abolition of the slave trade, let me most seriously urge on the conscientious deliberations of those who by their fatal proposal of gradual instead of immediate abolition, dash the cup of happiness from the lips of the wretched African and thus proved, in fact, the most efficient supporters of the slave trade. Uh, and so as you were talking about pain capability and certainly as we've here in Texas uh, in some ways applauded the idea of the heartbeat bill, uh, how much longer is abortion going to be prolonged because we've taken a gradual approach rather than an immediate approach um, and really shifted the goalposts to a at-home chemical on-demand in the mail abortion? practice across our country? 
I know how I want to respond, but I want to hear Gene respond to that. <laughs> well, I think you're right to raise the issue of chemical abortion because that is clearly where abortion is moving to. And, and, and I, think, I think that's the next big fight uh, for the pro-life movement. And, you know, if, if Roe is overturned, then it's going to be easier for states uh, to regulate the, you know, the, the prescribing and taking of chemical abortion pills within their state boundaries. The problem is that it's going to be so much easier for people to get them by mail order and that sort of thing, which is one reason I think part of the, part of the strategy for the pro-life movement going forward needs to be to, you know, to bring serious legal challenges to those who to those who make and, and distribute chemical abortion drugs. And there, there are a number of tools that can be used to, you know, to hold them accountable for the enormous harm that, uh, that, those, that those drugs inflict on the, on the women who take them. And, uh, and, and I think that needs to be an important part of the strategy. I'll just add to that. I think that um, as organizations and as we think about how to address uh, kind of the supply side of that equation, Heartbeat is at the forefront of operating the abortion pill rescue network, which offers the opportunity to women to reverse an in-progress chemical abortion. And I will affirm absolutely what you said. I mean, we get calls from women who have received the chemical abortion through the internet. They've never spoken to a human being. They don't even have an actual diagnosis of pregnancy. And they get these pills through the internet, through the mail. Um, Heartbeat has had the distinct privilege of being able to work with them to help to rescue their babies from those in-progress abortions. Uh, this works, you know, 85% of the time to help women, and we, our statistics are showing that there are now 3,000 lives that are walking around that were marked for death by the pro-abortion lobby. They're walking amongst us. They're starting kindergarten. They're, they've just celebrated their first Christmas. And so we're working on that supply side as well. And it's a both and. Yeah. It's a both and. Yeah, I, I want to respond to the earlier part of, of your question. And, and that's by saying that we have to define who we are, uh, just in terms of say, why did we decide, you know, et cetera. Uh, and, and speaking of a gradualist approach, the central conservative predicament in history is that we are responsive to what we see as a failure to conserve what must be conserved. So that's, that's why you often hear the left refer to the conservatives as reactionary. And so we have had to deal with the legal opportunities we've had. Mm -hmm. And the pro-life movement's made mistakes. It's, uh, it's made compromises I wish I hadn't made, but by and large, we have to look back and say that many brave people took every opportunity they had, whether they were legislators in states like Texas uh, or, or state leaders, I should include the governor in, in many states, uh, or if it were uh, federal district court judges and, and, and then appellate court judges and Supreme Court justices. We, we've taken what we've taken. And so the, uh, the, the case that was taken, Dobbs, did not present the Supreme Court with the constitutional question as to whether or not abortion should be made illegal in every state. Uh, th that would be a different question. The question that was presented was, do the states have the, will the states have the right to restrict abortion? And, and so I just, I just want to say that, 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 that part of the problem, liberals have a we in a sense that conservatives never have a we. There isn't a conservative central command trying to uh, figure out where the left will take a revolution. Uh, instead, we are, and this is the predicament again of conservatives throughout history, we are responding at times to events that we find simply by truth, morality, God, and country unacceptable. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Could I just add one point to that? Yes. I, you know, I, I think many folks in the pro-life movement think that, well, if, if the court overturns Roe against Wade, right. the next step is that they will, that, is that they will hold that, uh, you know, that a fetus is a person, right. and therefore uh, that states have to prevent abortions. Uh, but, but that is almost certainly not going to happen, right? So it, it, if Roe is overturned, 
protecting life is no longer really going to be so much a, a legal battle as a, you know, as a, it's not going to be a, a litigation battle. It's going to be much more of a, a political battle. In 50 states. In 50 states. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have to fight in every, in every state to protect life there as a political matter because one of, one of the interesting aspects of the argument uh, was that Justice Kavanaugh, for example, and, I, and I'm quite sure he speaks for the vast majority of the more conservative justice, uh, justices on the court, his position was very clear. The Constitution is neutral on abortion. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't provide a basis for prohibiting it, um, and it also doesn't provide a basis for preventing the states from regulating it. It's, it's neutral on, on abortion, and so I think we, we have to assume that that's going to be the case. We can't, we can't think that, you know, we, we can't be deceived into thinking that maybe, you know, with the right litigation strategy, we can get the court to go a big step further, because I think that's, that's extremely unlikely. And conservative constitutionalists understand that there is a way to make certain that the Constitution states the absolute right, uh, the sanctity of life uh, for the unborn, and that is by amending the Constitution. And that's why eventually some kind of human life amendment is going to be absolutely yep. necessary. And uh, the failure, by the way, even at, state, at the state level to get this passed has been a huge disappointment in my adult lifetime. I, I've been absolutely astounded. The state of Mississippi, arguably the most pro-life uh, state in the union in terms of its, of its vote, turned down a, uh, a personhood amendment uh, to its own state constitution. We have a huge battle. By the way, the Lord's called his people to battle from the very beginning of, uh, of, of covenant history. So we should expect that we're called to battle. Uh, and that's why we say that the reversal of Roe, for which we pray, is essential but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rather than one great trumpet calling us to battle, they're going to be 50. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Thank you for having me and thank you for the trout and thank you for y'all being here. Um, Mrs. White, when you said what spoke to me, I'm sorry, um, in 1992, there were like three, and then you said the main cause or main purpose of Roe v. Wade was for a woman to be what a man could be. So in 1990, I was raped and had a baby, and Planned Parenthood was the only thing available to me, but I still had her. She's 31 now, of course. Wow. My <laughs> My question to you and to the gentleman up there, um, I have children and grandchildren, and there is a thing about men wanting to have babies now. So I'm asking the question is, what impact, if you think any, that will have if a woman could do what a man can do and therefore she needs an abortion, Will a man wanting to have a baby have an impact on this decision Roe v. Wade overturned? I know what you're saying. And by the way, God bless your testimony to the sanctity of human life. Absolutely. As represented in your body. But I simply have to jump in here and say that there will never be a case in which a man gives birth to a baby. <laughs> And if we are the last people who know that and get arrested for saying that, I'll go to jail with you. And if you don't go to jail with me, I'll come and shame you. <laughs> but this shows you how moral disorder descends upon a culture to such an extent that we're talking about Roe v. Wade suggesting that the text of the Constitution isn't important. Now we have people arguing that biology uh, isn't important. And by the way, the very people who say trust the science don't trust the science of XX and XY. <laughs> that's that's too, probably saying too much, but nonetheless. <laughs> um, a, a, as we think about this, I think we have to recognize that a society that intends to go insane will go insane. And it's impossible to go insane in one dimension of life and keep sanity in the other. I was talking to someone earlier tonight. I said, you know, one of the great impediments to Marxism is math. <laughs> and uh, you can argue that, in, in essence, one of the reasons that Marxism uh, as, and communism in, in the Soviet Union ran out of steam is because they could not make two plus two equal anything other than four. 
And so, you know, integers, um, numbers uh, refuted Marxism. Well, biology is going to refute the transgender ideology. So I will say that a society that will simply embrace the logic of abortion sets loose the toxins of this liberationist, emancipationist, personal autonomy ethic to the point that you can't now tell a man, no, yes, not true, you can't now tell a woman that she is not a man who has just given birth. So in other words, that far down the descent of insanity, there isn't a constitutional argument to be made. Am I wrong, Gene? I, th I, I think you're right. I don't know how many of you saw Jesse Waters uh, last night, but he, he, inter he interviewed a woman who identifies as a wolf. So that, that's, <laughs> that, you know, that's just the next logical step in the, in the chain of, you know, of personal autonomy. It's <laughs> well, in all seriousness, you've got, yeah, this is blurs all the distinctions. And so, uh, you know, on the plane yesterday, I'm looking at very serious articles that include legislative proposals to uh, declare animals persons. You know, so animals are going to be persons, but unborn human beings are not going to be persons according to this logic. So, in other words, insanity will not end in June of 2022. We hope that sanity returns to a group of, a majority of a group of nine. That would be a good place to start, but we've got a lot more reality to bring. Danielle? Yeah. Um I, I think it's interesting. I'd love for you to speak as the only person on this panel who can and has had a baby. <laughs> I, so. I have, yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's interesting that um, the, the pro-abortion argument gets up and they, they say, we need equality for women, we need equality for women, but I'm not sure that they agree with what the definition of a woman is. Right. And so, you, you know, we can't, we can't have these conversations about equality for women and women need to be able to compete with men if we aren't clear on what exactly we're, we're talking about here. Um, and I, I think that it's just the case that the, the woman's role in bringing life into this world is just so unique that it needs to be protected and that it needs to be supported. And um, I'm really excited to watch because I think that the pro-life movement is up for the challenge. I think we're ready. I don't think any of us here would consider it a win for Roe v. Wade to be overturned, but women to be left destitute or unable to prepare for their, or to care for their children. And so I think that we're, we're ready. We're ready for this moment. And yeah, there's some insanity reigning, but biology is biology. And when those biological women bring their biological babies into our real pregnancy centers, they will assist them with millions of dollars worth of care and with compassion. And that's, I think, what's truly important. I'm tracking an issue in which uh, there's opposition to naming uh, something in honor of Ruth Bader Ginsburg because she was so on the wrong side of history on the transgender issue. Mm -hmm. But then after all, she was the attorney for a feminist movement. And there's no fun being a feminist if you don't know who a woman is. Yeah. All right, that's a different issue. <laughs> yes, I see it right here. Someone who has the microphone. Hi, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge. I think, Danielle, something that you said has provoked me to speak what I've been thinking, which is you can't talk about being pro-life without acknowledging that the pro-life movement is directly in contrast to the second wave of feminism that you have shared tonight. And I have a two-part question, which is, one, is there, I didn't watch the oral arguments that my husband did, and I wish he was here tonight to tell you what um, he thought about it, but is, was there anyone that made an argument in the oral arguments that Promoting equality of women is not only at the degradation of our society due to its negative impact on the unborn, but on society at large. Um, and if so, what did they share? And then two, um, is there anything that we as the pro-life movement could be doing to better partner with the second wave feminist movement in education or um, just 
you know, information sharing because I think it's going to be a step one in saying we need a law, but then two, it's changing opinion. So um, that was a lot, but I would love to hear what you have to say. I'll start. Daniel? So, um, mm -hmm. yes, I thought the Solicitor General did a fantastic job for, for Mississippi of talking about the harms to our society precisely because the court has removed all of us from having a voice in this issue. And I thought he did a great job um, really uh, saying it's time for the court to return this issue back to the people um, rather than making it all bound up in these nine unelected judges. Um, I thought that Justice Barrett's comments, which we actually haven't talked about yet, about um, the safe haven laws and, and, and adoption more generally were really insightful because she said to the other side's attorneys, you're making this argument that um, you should be free from the burdens of parenthood. And that's not really what this, about, what this is about, isn't it? Because you can relinquish your parental obligations and your parental rights at any time. So what we're really talking about is not this participation in the economic and social life of the nation, which is hindered theoretically by parenthood. What we're talking about is those nine months of pregnancy. And I thought that that was really helpful um, to really narrow in the focus of, um, you know, this is what we're really talking about. I thought it was very interesting that the response from the other side was, she made a comment to the effect of, women have a right not to bear their children and then have another, have their child out there. And that was astonishing to me. I, I didn't know that I had a right to just decide that someone else can't be out there. I mean, that was just mind blowing well, to Dan me. Daniel, to, to, God bless you for that. But you know that uh, horrifyingly enough, many people in the pro-abortion movement have been making the argument that forcing a woman, in their language, to have a baby implies a relationship with that child that will be emotionally wrenching if she gives that child away. But it's supposedly not emotionally wrenching if she destroys it in her womb 12 hours before birth. Yeah. Right. And I mean, it's an illogic, but again, this is a losing argument for the pro-abortion movement. The more you talk about it, the more ludicrous it appears. Gene, you have thoughts on this? Well, I, I, we're just going through a situation in our family where my, um, <clears throat> my son's wife, um, they have one little boy and they wanted to have another and, and his wife got pregnant and, and she just had a miscarriage like mm. three or four weeks mm. ago. And I, uh, my, my wife didn't have any miscarriages and so I, you know, I haven't had the experience until now of watching somebody at close range who's had a miscar miscarriage. And her, you know, her baby was you know, probably only five or six weeks along. Right, very, very, very young, and yet, you know, it's been very difficult for her to, you know, for her to deal with that, Bless her with heart. that great loss. And uh, um, so there's no, you know, there's there, there's no escaping the fact that, you know, that for many, many women at least, getting an abortion is going to be a an emotionally wrenching experience that's going to live with live with her for the, in all likelihood, for the rest of her life. Yeah. I'd like to swing back to your, your question about the education, and I think some of that is, is in our own lived example of um, having our own children, of having our own families, and of women who are very successful in their careers, very successful in their endeavors. And I'd, I'd like to just share, you know, when, when this case, when, when Sir Sharari was granted, I uh, happened to be on maternity leave. I had just had a little baby girl. And, but writing a brief where I'm asking the court to overturn <laughs> Rowan Casey was a career aspiration that I could only have dreamt of. And that little girl didn't stop me from writing it. I wrote that brief in the wee hours of the night with her up on my shoulder and my laptop on my lap, and she was an embodiment of what I was fighting for. I knew that this little human only weeks prior had no legal protection. And I knew that other women were sitting in their own homes without children up on their shoulders. They were robbed of motherhood. And I think that there are enough women who have experienced miscarriage, who have experienced abortion, who feel the pain of that robbing of their motherhood. And I think that that's an important yeah. thing for us to share. And, and I think it's an educational piece that's valuable. Well, Danielle, thank you for sharing thank you. that. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I simply wanna say that when I'm asked by Christians so many times, what is it we can do? 
I say whatever we should do, certainly the political, the electoral, the legislative, the judicial challenges, we need to do that. But here's the Christian answer all the way from the time of the apostles. Preach the gospel, teach the word of God, hold fast to the truth, and outbreed. <laughs> <laughs> The falling, the catastrophic falling birth rate of those who hold to a secular worldview means that when you go to your Bible preaching church, your gospel believing church, you see the future knee high mm -hmm. yep. and in the nursery. I'll leave on that note. God bless you. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you. Amazing, amazing work. Thank y'all for being here. Join on our knees to pray and grab your card and join us at the Council for Life. Thank y'all.